Kimberly Watson and Dr. Karina Shukla, who both of you. I wish to remind folks that after today's talk, we often have a happy hour. This time it's going to be at the Atlas Ballroom. So if you don't know where that is, it is down the road near downtown, South College and 4th Street. I know it's a little bit more of a walk, but that might be good. You know, your, your, you know, your smartphones won't shame you for under-exercising. You'll get all your steps in. Um, additionally, I do have some room in my car, so if you are unable to do the walk, I can take my guest here and maybe a couple of other folks. Um, that said, if you do have a noise please turn it off. Turn it on silent. Turn it on airport mode if you like. This is getting close to the end of the semester. This is the end of week 10. And we do have a couple more talks to go in the Focum series. Uh, next week, we will have another alumnus, uh, Langston Wilkins, coming. And then we will have the Dorsen lecture, Greg Rolsford, in April. So again, on behalf of the colloquium committee, Dr. Shook, myself, Kimberly Watson, and Olivia Phillips, we wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington is built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, the Delaware, the Patawatami, the Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. And as always, when I do this speech, I invite you, because I try to make this more than just lip service and formative, and I will donate $20 to a colleague of ours, Renata Yazzi, who's the founder and director of the American Indian Music Musician Scholarship. And I invite you, you're not required to, but I extend this invitation uh, to, to do something similar. So without any further ado, at this time, I will pass the mic to my graduate student colleague here, Olivia Phillips, who will introduce our guest this afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, a native of Thibodeau, Louisiana, Maria Zaring currently serves as the Folk and Traditional Arts Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission, where she manages the online publication Mississippi Folk Life and directs the Folk and Traditional Arts Grants Program. Her research interests in Carnival aligns with her lifelong passion for Louisiana Mardi Gras traditions, particularly the Gaines Mardi Gras Chase near her hometown. Outside of work, she is currently learning pottery and has also taken classes in weaving. She is passionate about instant photography, comics, music, costuming traditions, and art of all kinds. Before moving to Mississippi, she worked for the Traditional Arts Indiana program and completed an internship with the Louisiana Folklife program. She has published articles for the Smithsonian's Folklife magazine, Louisiana Folklife program, Journal of Folklore Research Reviews, Louisiana Folklore, Miscellany, and the Journal of Ethnic American Literature. She has master's degrees in French and folklore from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette and Indiana University, respectively. Uh, so please welcome Maria Zarang. six years since I've been at the Mississippi Arts Commission. Um, so yeah, this is just kind of a, an overview of my day-to-day -day life at the commission. And I, this is just to kind of show uh, the students um, the type of work that they could be doing if they work at a state agency. So I'm just going to kind of go over a lot of what I do at MAC. That's, the, uh, that's what we call it internally, MAC. And just because Mississippi Arts Commission is a mouthful, I'm just going to refer to it as MAC. Uh, for the rest of the talk. This is me um, hanging out with some people, telling them about grants, and uh, you know, sometimes when you're on the job and you're like the only person there, you also have to take the photos. And I was like, oh, I forgot to take a photo of everyone. And they're like, well, what about you? Do you want to be in the photos? I was like, let's just take a selfie. And uh, <laughs> they uh, really enjoyed that. So I'm actually going to be doing a work with a lot of these folks this is in Tishmingo County in Northeast Mississippi. That's kind of what 
I'm working on next. All right, so um, I just thought it would be helpful to do an outline. Um, I thought it would be good to start with my background. I'm just going to briefly talk about that, kind of how I got to folklore and, you know, to work at a state arts agency, um, kind of the training that I had that kind of got me uh, to this point. And then um, I'm actually going to go into the details of what I do, and I broke it up into two different types. So that's public programming and grants. That's how we look at it at MAC. That's how I look at it uh, kind of when I divide my task for the day. So uh, I'll talk about public programs first, then grants. Then um, I'm just going to kind of share with you the skills that I learned on the job, um, some things that I kind of developed while at MAC, and maybe some things for you all to consider as grad students, you know, kind of as you're working on your degree and kind of thinking about the future and what else is out there. Um, and then that also coincides with the last slide, kind of, uh, this is some resources or just kind of tips on, you know, how to prepare to do this work. Okay, um, so let's start with my path to public folklore. Um, well, I think like a lot of people, you don't grow up thinking like, I'm going to be a public folklorist. <laughs> like, you know, you don't really know what that is. Um, so for me, I learned about it through a class and through a mentor. A show of hands, who learned about folklore through a mentor? Okay, or like a class at a university? Okay, and then did anyone grow up being like, I want to be a folklore? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so, yeah, only one person. Um, but yeah, I think this kind of more common. I was getting my master's degree at UL Lafayette uh, in Francophone studies, French literature. I was studying Acadian literature and um, in comics. Um, and I took this class with Barry Onsolet, who maybe some of you are familiar with him, uh, Provina Brandon, <laughs> Brandon with the UL Lafayette, yeah, right? Um, he is also a graduate of IU. Uh, he's also a folklorist, a very prominent folklorist in Louisiana. And th that was the class, Louisiana French Folklore, and it was about kind of doing oral history and doing kind of folklore work with the French speaking community. And for that class, I had to do a project, and I picked the Gaines Mardi Gras because I had family um, who participated in it. Uh, the guy in the yellow is my cousin Paul. He still uh, chases, and he has a son, and maybe hopefully a son will chase one day. Um, so I just decided to do that, you know, because I knew people uh, who did it. And I really, like, became enamored with Mardi Gras and this kind of other side, studying it in a scholarly way, looking at the meaning behind the tradition, and that was when I was like, oh, you know, maybe there's another career path out there for me. In all of my literature studies, I always really liked the cultural aspect of the stuff that we were studying, and so when I learned about folklore and that it had kind of a history in literature departments too, I was like, oh, this is kind of a good transition. Uh, you know, maybe I can do this. Um, so. Um, he encouraged me to apply to IU to apply to other programs, and I ended up, you know, obviously going to IU. Um, and before I went to IU, I was like, I, I don't know if I'm ready for this, you know. My only intro to folklore is Mardi Gras, and I just feel like I need to do something else before I go to IU. So I had some free time. I had a whole summer that was free. And uh, Barry was like, you know, you should reach out to Maida. Maida Owens is my counterpart in Louisiana. She still works. Excuse me. She still works there. Um, so she works for the Louisiana Division of the Arts and runs the Louisiana Folk Life Program. So I reached out and I said, hey, do you have any kind of work for me or anything that I can do, maybe just to kind of learn more about it? And she's like, yeah, you can do an internship. I ha actually, I'm working on this larger project. Baton, this Baton Rouge uh, Folk Life Survey, Baton Rouge Traditions was the name of the project. And she's like, if you want to be a part of it, you can. And I, it was really like a job shadowing process. And I, I kind of learned how to, how I could apply my degree before I even started um, at the state level. And I realized that I really liked that kind of work. And, um, and, and even through my you know, years at IU, that's kind of what I wanted to do. And so this is just a picture of the project that I worked on with Maida. Um, it was my first contract job. Uh, in, in the talk with students, we talked about contract work as a way to kind of gain experience, experience 
uh, maybe before getting um, kind of the real adult job, I guess, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I worked with small food business owners, and this was uh, Emma Mencia Royal. She was a tea cake maker. I also looked at boudin makers, um, specialty grocery stores, a, a bunch of just kind of food businesses in Baton Rouge, and then that ultimately led to an essay and being a part of her exhibit. So not only was it an internship, but I also had like published work uh, that went along with that. And then, so that summer, after that, I went to IU. Uh, John, do you recognize this here? That's the cover of the brochure for uh, John's uh, Bicentennial exhibit that I worked on. So not only, you know, when I started IU, of course I was learning the field. I was learning the history of the discipline, the main concepts, theories, you know, all the kind of academic knowledge base that you need to do this job. And I think that's one thing that you really can't learn on the job. And that's why kind of getting that academic training is really important. It's something that I use. I'm putting all those intellectual concepts into practice every single day. You know, all the time people are asking you what's folklore, what's folk art. And it's like you're taking your master's exam. So uh, study for the master's <laughs> exam because that will not be the last time you are tested. Uh, you will always be tested in public folklore work. <laughs> uh, and it won't just be for a grade. Um, so yeah, getting that academic, um, that base is the foundation of the work that I do. But also at IU, I was able to get some uh, public training uh, working at TAI. So I worked at Traditional Arts Indiana for two years. And I was really lucky be okay, wait, hold on. I need to take a sip of water. But um, I was really lucky because while I was there, I was able to work on a big project. And uh, if I remember correctly, Okay, wait, pause for water. <laughs> if I remember correctly, you know, John, you were, you had started it, but we had still, we were still doing a lot of field work when I, when I jumped on. Um, so along with the other grad students, um, I was able to do field work, you know, so get hands-on experience working in communities, you know, driving around the state of Indiana, interviewing, processing all of that data, and then putting it together in exhibit text and then editing it. I remember it was me, John, Emily Burke, and then Meredith, I think, too. We would just read the text aloud and be like, does that sound right? You know? <laughs> so I have very vivid memories of doing that. Um, and then we took it on the road. We did 20 public programs for that. That's what I had in my notes, and I think that that's right. I think I did more, but you did probably 20 public programs. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, of course, yeah. So while I was there, I think I did uh, 20. And it was mostly in the state park system. And so that really kind of opened my eyes to doing programming in non-traditional exhibit spaces and kind of meeting people where they're at. Another program that um, really was inspiring to me was the Rotating Exhibit Network uh, that TAI does. Do um, you still do that where it travels around the state libraries? Uh, so I worked on a couple of panels for that and then talked to artists who were a part of it and learning their feedback and, you know, how they appreciate it and how kids would come up to them and be like, oh, you're the guy from the library, you know, and just kind of what that meant for them. That inspired me to do kind of something similar in Mississippi. Um, so I started doing programming with the library this past year. I just finished one in January. It's just a great community space, and in Mississippi they're severely underfunded. Um, so that, you know, inspired me, my work at TAI. So with that combined, the Louisiana experience and then the Indiana experience, I jumped to MAC. And a lot of the work that I did at TAI and for the Louisiana Folklife Program, that directly translates uh, to the work that I'm doing at Mississippi. It's, you know, very much uh, similar to what I'm doing. Um, okay, so I just want to show you a little bit about... Um, who we are at the commission, sorry, I lost my diner. Uh, okay, here we go. Who we are at the commission, um, we are an 11-person agency, so that is very small, you know, for a state or arts agency. We're also a small state, predominantly rural. There's three, close to three million people there. Um, I wish we could be a little bit more funded and uh, have a bigger staff, but we're, we kind of do it, you know, all hands on deck, and we all kind of pitch in. It's a very collaborative environment. And most people at MAC, um, well, around the state, they know MAC as a grants-making agency. So that means they know that if they're an individual artist, if they're a community member or an organization, they can apply 
to MAC for a grant to do their programming, to help bolster their career as an artist, give them a little bit of financial stability. We give out 1.6 million in grants, and that varies you know, from state to state. So for some states, that might be just what they give one operating grantee. Uh, for us, this is kind of what we give everyone. Uh, and we just kind of split it in the most ways that we can. Now, uh, we also do other things besides grants, although grants is a lot of our work. Um, we do a lot of public programming. All the public programming that I'm going to talk about, of course, is under Mac's public programming umbrella. But I just wanted to kind of highlight two other ones that weren't related to folklore at all. One is the Governor's Arts Awards. Um, I think Indiana has one. Um, so some of you may be familiar with that. It is the Lifetime Achievement Award for creative Mississippians. Uh, it's just based on artistic excellence and your contribution to the arts community in Mississippi. We, uh, this is a TV show. It's kind of broadcast uh, on MPV. So, you know, that's kind of cool to kind of be able to work with the, the radio station and the local public broadcasting station to put that on. And then we also do an arts conference where we convene all of our partners, just kind of people who are interested in the arts, people who are in that humanities, culture kind of network in the state. And we just talk about best practices, the challenges that we face that are very specific to Mississippi. Uh, and we do that once a year, usually uh, in the fall. Uh, it was actually always the same time at AFS, and I petitioned that it um, not be that, so um, I could go to AFS. <laughs> they didn't think about it. Um, okay, so we also do professional development, and we're trying to do more of this. Um, you know, for the students that actually that came to the thing before, this example, I was talking about a coworker of mine, Kristen Brandt, who is trained in folklore. She went to WKU. This is her project, and all of us kind of help out um, on it. I helped uh, facilitate this as well, you know, just managing the Q&A and questions and stuff like that. But we try to do uh, professional development programming um, so that the artists can get something more than financial resources. Uh, they can get, you know, training and, you know, kind of whatever we are able to offer. So this is just an example of one. Uh, so this was a webinar we had last Friday, and this was a, an accountant who also had an MFA, and she was very much aware of what it's like to do your taxes as a self-employed artist. So um, she kind of went over all of that, um, and yeah, it was great. We, we did a bunch of them. We still have more planned, but this is just to give you an example of like the non-kind of folklore work that I'm doing. And then also at MAC, we're a statewide networker in the arts, so we see ourselves as like a connector, um, a hub, let's say, of someone. And this was a real request. We get these requests all the time. If someone wants to start an artist residency program and they don't have a lot of experience doing that, they will call us and we can either give them resources or connect them to other organizations who have done that before so they can kind of serve as like a consultant or give advice. So we're all about just kind of sharing knowledge as best we can. Um, okay, so now I am going to talk about the specific stuff that I do as a folk and traditional arts director. Now this is just the programming side, so I'm going to talk about all that first, and then I'm going to go into grants. <coughs> okay, so the first thing, the first bullet point, I think this is really important. I am, you know, the director of the program, I'm the only kind of person that is like employed by Mac that is doing this work, but I also do this work with a lot of different people. So of course the artists, the traditional artists, community members, all of our partners at other like museums uh, and organizations who kind of are in a similar <coughs> field as us, and then contractors. I have a contractor here today, Emily Bryant, she does work for us. Um, I have long-term contractors that have been working with me for years. I also have short-term contractors that are just kind of doing it on a project basis. Um, and so all of that work could not be possible, you know, without that whole, that's why I titled it The Collective Effort, because we're all kind of pitching in and doing it together. You know, I'm just the facilitator, um, and it all just, like, it can't come from me. And also it shouldn't just come from me. Um, okay, so... The, the next two bullet points, that represents my online programming. Um, 
you know, it's kind of weird to say, but half of my time at MAC has been during the pandemic. Um, so I have done a lot of virtual work. So I wanted to show you my online platforms, and I'm going to go into that detail a little bit later. So I'm going to skip those, but um, that's the Folk Life, uh, Mississippi Folk Life and the Folk Life Directory. Um, and then, of course, I also do various exhibits and public programs. Uh, throughout the year. Some years are leaner on the public programming if I'm doing more research. Uh, and some years I'm doing heavy, you know, public programming. Like some of the pictures in the introduction, that kind of came from a lot of the public programming that I'm doing. And what do I mean by public programming? I, I mean, it can, it just, it ranges from like exhibits, pop-up exhibits, a pop-up exhibit that I did at the public library. Um, it could be demonstrations where artists are coming out and, and demonstrating, you know, what they do. It could be panels, artist talks, uh, you know, you name it. Like one example that I do every year is the Apprenticeship Showcase. Um, how many of you are familiar with an apprenticeship program? Okay, so yeah, almost everyone. So that's where like a master artist, they work with a, a more up and coming emerging artist to kind of pass on their skills and their techniques is kind of like a passing and on grant uh, that we fund. And at the end of the year, we do a public program to showcase like, okay, this is what we did this year. And it's a way to educate the public and create awareness about traditional arts. Um, and that one changes every year because it just kind of depends on who's in the program. So that's also kind of fun adapting it to the different artists and kind of what their needs and styles are. Um, and then, I mentioned this in the other talk before, but uh, I also do a little bit of radio at MAC, which I have just really been enjoying. We have a radio show called the Mississippi Arts Hour, and I'm one of five hosts, so I do a show once a month. And I always try to pick a traditional artist, so that could be my contribution. Um, and it's just an hour-long uh, interview with an, with an artist, some kind of creative Mississippian, um, just to kind of talk about what they do. So if you want to check us out, MPB Think Radio, Sundays at 5 p.m. <laughs> um, and then we're also available on podcasts. So if you want to check us out on Spotify, Apple Music, you know, we're there too. Um, and then I'm also the steward of the archive. So for the past 40 years, Mac has had an archive. It uh, dates back to the 80s. Um, it's mostly photos and audio files. It is completely digitized. Um, and so I'm just kind of the steward of that collection. I use it for programming. I use it um, uh, for educational purposes. If we get a lot of researchers or community members, if they're doing projects of their own, they will ask us for photos or audio files. And uh, it's my job to give that out to the public with some context and credits. And then, of course, everything that I do is founded on research, field work. And then, of course, we want to promote everything. So I work with a social media team at MAC. Um, we do press releases. I'm sometimes on local radio stations or uh, the newspaper, local TV stations promoting that work. And that has been interesting, learning how to like be on TV. Uh, I talked about that uh, in the talk. And then, of course, everything that I do uh, has to be funded. Uh, and we usually have uh, state and federal dollars to fund that. Our largest funder is the National Endowment for the Arts. So it is my job to um, manage that budget. All right, so let's get into some details. I just were picking out a few little projects. Um, mostly I'm going to focus on the online projects. And that is Mississippi Folklife. It's an online publication that is dedicated to documenting uh, traditional artists, practices, uh, any type of folk life, cultural heritage of the state. It is <clears throat> a general interest uh, publication, um, so it's not necessarily an academic publication, although we do have a lot of scholars and academics that contribute, but we also have artists who want to contribute and write about the, you know, write their own story. Some of them have never even written an article before, and we help them uh, make that possible. And of course, it would not be possible without my team, my editorial team that I do this work in collaboration with. So that's me at the top. I'm the managing editor. And then next, um, I work with a series of, uh, a group of four editors. So Emily Burrell Rogers, she's also a graduate of this program. And um, 
her research also has a Mississippi focus. So she's a part of our team. Amanda Malloy, she's from Oxford, Mississippi. Now she is working as a folklorist in South Carolina, but she has uh, she's still a part of the team. Addie Kitchens is from Clarksdale. She's a writer and an editor, and uh, she's based in Louisiana now. And then Emily Bryant is um, our digital editor. So um, all the layout and the beautiful photos, the photo editing, and how Mississippi Folk Life looks um, so good, it's thanks to Emily Bryant. <laughs> Just wanted to give Emily a shout out. Um, Okay, so just a little bit more about Mississippi Folk Life. We are on a flexible schedule. We try to publish two to three times a year. That's kind of our goal. But every now and then things happen. You know, I'm managing a lot of different programs, so sometimes it's two times a year. It just kind of depends. We're, um, we just try to be flexible and just kind of roll with what we have. Um, each issue, uh, we usually have two to four features, but generally it's three. We usually do three features. And those features could be articles, so long form, short form articles, photo essays, and occasionally we get uh, short documentary films. And I love when we get those. Uh, most of our issues are kind of a general call where we just have a mix of articles in each issue. But every now and then we do a special themed issue like we did for the pandemic. We did two special themed issues back to back. I'll talk briefly about that in a second. <coughs> and our submissions are on a rolling basis, but I do do a lot of work in the editors as well, but being that I'm kind of on the ground in Mississippi, um, we all kind of do work to try to solicit articles. Um, so that's kind of part of the job too, is promoting to get uh, contributors. And then we also have an exhibits page. That is a product of the pandemic because, you know, I had to switch to virtual programming during those years where we, you know, social isolation was necessary. and. Um, so I expanded Mississippi Folk Life, and we were able to do a lot of online exhibits, and we are still doing that. I've actually just really been enjoying that. We are working on one right now that we're almost finished, um, and so we're going to have another one coming up soon. And then we also have um, digitized a couple, a handful of the print issues. My predecessor digitized those. Mississippi Folk Life as an organization goes back to 1927. And it was a print uh, magazine for many years at universities. And we were gifted a lot of those print issues. So my predecessor digitized a handful of them. We just got another donation of issues, and I'd love to work on digitizing those in the, in the near future. And so this is an example, this is the cover of one of our older issues. Um, that was from 1999. Okay, so this is a screenshot of the kind of the home page of Mississippi Folk Life. Um, and this is our last two issues. So the bottom row is um, our second to last issue that we put out. It was called Performances in the Pandemic, where we looked at the pandemic's impact on musicians and organizations are, uh, that rely on regular performance. How did they adapt? What did they do? Um, so we invited people to talk about that. Then the second one is, um, Craft and community in the time of COVID, that's the top row, those three articles. <coughs> and that looked at how craftspersons and um, just kind of community members, how did, they, how did their work change? You know, how did they connect with each other during the pandemic? Um, so that was that last issue. And I have a, oh, wait, hold on, what's that? I wonder if it'll, oh wait, do I need to exit out? All right, let's see. Okay, here we go. Can y'all see that? Oh, no. It only came up on the, um, Okay, oh, just press escape, mm -hmm. and then it'll come. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's it. Okay, can you all, yeah, y'all can see that. Okay, good. Um, so I just kind of wanted to show you how the articles were laid out. Um, this one was a really cool article that we did on the uh, war gaming community and during the pandemic they really had to focus on the craft part of that gameplay and so Alice and Cassandra O'Neill kind of wrote about their experience doing that. Um, so we, we are kind of photo heavy, we love to do photos, we do uh, pull quotes, uh, we kind of just pick you know dynamic quotes from the article um, to kind of help with the design. 
and yeah, so this is kind of what they look like. This is a photo taken by my coworker Kristen Brandt, and this is our two writers, Alice and, and Cassandra. Uh, and then I just wanted to show you real quick. So this is the uh, oh, this is the articles page where you can see everything that we've done. I think we've published about I don't know 80 articles so far, maybe more. I uh, lost count at like 60 something. Um, all right, that's the home page. This is our exhibits page, and maybe if you want to ask me about this, I don't think that we'll um, have time for this. Um, but this was all the stuff that we've been doing since 2020 uh, on the exhibits page. Now, since we've had the pandemic, we feature our apprenticeship uh, participants. We do an, an online showcase as well as the in-person one, when we can do the in-person one. Um, we just had Cedric and R.L. Boyce. Uh, he just won. That was just announced a couple weeks ago. So we're going to add him. Um, so we wanted to do an exhibit to honor all the National Heritage Fellows because when Cedric won, he was the first Mississippian to win a National Heritage Fellow uh, since 1997. Uh, so we wanted to try to promote uh, and get people to, um, you know, promote the program and get people to nominate Mississippians because we definitely have a lot of artists that are worthy of the fellowship. And then this was the, the exhibit that started it all that started this exhibit's page, that's Folk Life and the Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi. <clears throat> this was an exhibit that I worked on over a couple of years, and it looked at the uh, intersection of traditional arts and how artists and community members were commemorating the history and legacy of the Civil Rights Movement in the state. And then real quick, these are some of our print issues. And you can just click on them and uh, check out the issues. You can read them. Uh, okay, so then I just do that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So now I'm just briefly going to go over uh, the Folklife Directory just to kind of show you uh, what that looks like. So whereas Mississippi Folklife is a deep dive, um, the Folklife Directory is just kind of a snapshot in a series of artist profiles to just kind of show the different types of traditional artists and practices that exist and are still a part of Mississippi culture. It's organized into artist pages and this is a, just, just like a screen cap of a little piece of the home page, but it's mostly um, kind of a search engine to look at all the different artists that we have. It's a way to bring the archive out into the public in a contextual way and it's also a way for me to put up some of the documentation that I'm doing and that my contractors and collaborators are doing as part of the uh, Folklife program. So um, let me just show you. You can search it three ways. You can search the directory to find artists, um, either through artistic medium, craft, performance, visual arts, architecture, foodways, or Folklife. You can search it by region. These are kind of six generally accepted regions of the state, or you can search by their name. So you can type in Alan, and Alan Kolodny here, his profile will come up. Or if you want to look at crafts people in the Red Clay Hills, you just click the word craft and then Red Clay Hills and then they all populate. Um, so I tried to make it as easily as possible so you can see very quickly um, kind of what exists in the state. And then I wanted to show you Real quick, what an artist page looks like. So I have a link, but I'm just going to exit out. This is my last link, and then we're going to stay in the PowerPoint. Um, okay, yeah, and you can see that. Um, okay, so this is Janice Mitchell, um, and this is some photos that we have. All of these photos, except these bottom three, were taken by the wonderful photographer Rory Doyle, based in Cleveland, Mississippi. Um, so you can have different kind of gallery designs. Here's her profile. If they want to include links or contact info, any video, anything that they want to put on, you know, we just kind of, you know, whatever they want. Um, you can, there's a caption here, and you can hover over it, or you can make the photo bigger, and you can, well, okay, it's not going to quite work with the pop-out, but you get the idea, right? So there's different kind of ways to engage with the material. Um, okay. Okay, I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to...
So there you go. That's the directory. I wanted to show you the home page, but I don't know what I do to get out of bed. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Okay, yeah. So this is where you would search. And this is the home page. And so this website was designed by the same designer, Tyler Tadlock. He's based in Jackson, who did those brochures. And that's just kind of, this is like an overview of the home page. Oh, and then I have these resources of, uh, and this might be something that y'all might be interested in, um, just state and regional folk life programs in the southeast, state and regional folk life organizations, research centers in Mississippi, and folk life destinations or other kind of sources uh, if y'all are interested in learning more about that. Okay. Um, here we go. Let me exit out of there. All right, back to the slideshow. Okay, so now briefly, and then I'm going to move on to grants, I just want to talk about one public program that I did. And it was my first one that I did at Mac. Um, because, you know, when you start, you're probably not going to start at the beginning of the fiscal year. You're probably going to start in the middle of a project, and you often have to take that over. Um, and so my predecessor was very kind enough to uh, leave me some ownership of this project so that I can kind of make it my own. And um, one of the students had asked, like, okay, um, how did the work at TAI kind of directly translate to the work that you're doing at Mac? And so at TAI, at TAI, I mostly did a bicentennial project, and it was Mississippi's bicentennial year, <laughs> my first year at Mac. So what did I have to do? A bicentennial program. So um, it really kind of gave me the confidence to kind of hit the ground running because I kind of already did it, and I, I, it was a great first project because I already had a lot of experience. <clears throat> and so it was a multi-region uh, program. It was four different exhibits. Three of them were mostly done, and my predecessor left one for me so I could kind of make the project my own. My own. And um, that one was called Material Culture in the Delta. There were different ones, like Food Waste in the Hill Country, Customs on the Coast, Material Culture in the Delta. So um, this is the one that I had to do when I, right when I first started. This is what I worked on my first six months. <coughs> this, is an, uh, this is kind of a picture of the final product. Uh, we did this in collaboration with the B.B. King Museum. And this is in one of their exhibit spaces. The Bicentennial Project was a, a photo exhibit. Uh, so we had photos of the artists and their work and then a caption uh, below the photo to provide some context. And um, this is some of the field work um, that I did. I went out and met with so, uh, several artists in the Delta. So this is just a few of them. Rebecca Hay, she is a leather worker. Johnny Smith, he's a painter, and we're actually working with him on Mississippi Folk Life uh, for the next issue. Randy New is a wood turner, so I did some, um, some field work with uh, all three of these artists. And then, you know, we put it together. We, um, I had some photos. A lot of the photos I took myself. Some of them my predecessor did. Um, so it's kind of a mix of both of our work. And this is what it looks like on the gallery wall in the B.B. King Museum. We also invited the artists to bring in their work. So you can see some paintings of Johnny and Bobby's work on easels. And then we had captions. So I just kind of wanted to show you like the caption. So this is Bobby Whalen. He's a sign painter uh, in Indianola. And um, I have become friends with Bobby. He's uh, just a, a really great guy. And it all kind of started in those first few months on the job. And this is an example of the text that we did that went under each photo. And um, this is kind of um, also a kind of a good thing uh, to kind of note. Like when I was at Tishomingo doing that project, here, because we are short staff, I was the one at the opening program where we invited all the artists and the public to come check it out and for the artists to talk about their work and show their work. Um, you know, I had to facilitate and I also had to take the photos. And because I was like emceeing and, you know, making sure the artists had what they needed, um, the only photos that I got 
we're towards the end. So this is kind of towards the end of the night when things are packing up. And this is definitely something that I always keep in mind now and kind of a, a, a lesson learned for the, for the programming. But this is just kind of showing you the other side of the room where the artists are stationed and they're kind of talking to people about what they do. That's Rebecca and she's kind of showing off some of her leather work. All right, so um, now I'm just gonna transition to uh, grant making. And then um, after this slide, I'll kind of talk about the skills that I learned on the job. Um, so grants at MAC, it's kind of an all hands on deck situation. Some arts agencies, they may have a designated staff that do a lot of the heavy lifting for grants. And maybe the public folklore is there they may only do the apprenticeship program or apprenticeship and fellowship, you know. Um, and then there are some agencies like um, ours where the public folklorist also manages other grant programs too. Most of my grants are connected to folk and traditional arts in some way. So I do handle the media arts fellowship, but that's the only other one that I, <coughs> that I do that's kind of outside of my expertise. Um, so these are the different types of grants. I manage 40 to 60 per year. Um, it's usually about 60 towards the end of the year after we have all the applications in. Um, so I manage fellowships, which are artistic excellence grants. Uh, the apprenticeships, which I've already talked about. Our roster, it's kind of like a guild in a way. It's a networking tool and they have to be adjudicated on through a grant. And then we also offer project grants for both individuals or nonprofits. Um, you know, schools, universities, and uh, municipalities. And then we also offer operating support. Uh, this is really important. Not all states do this, so I'm really glad that we're able to offer this. This is support that's desperately needed in every state in the country. This is support to help kind of keep the lights on. It's for administrative costs, rent, uh, utilities, um, all, all the stuff that's not programming, but that you need to survive. So I'm glad that we're able to offer uh, this type of support and I manage uh, a handful of operating support grantees. Now when people ask me, um, what's the one thing that you learned on the job that uh, I, you or your training couldn't prepare you for? And I feel like that is grants making. It's the number one thing. It's the first thing that came to mind when I was putting this presentation together. Um, and what is grants making? So you are um, giving grants to the public, but you're also helping them uh, apply for those grants. You're, um, you're just there as an assistant along the way to kind of help them with their technical needs, grant writing needs, anything along the way you're doing. And you're also kind of promoting the program. We try to promote as much as possible so that it is accessible as possible. Um, and I thought a good way to kind of describe what work this is since you know, I didn't know what grants were and this kind of program when I started. I also polled uh, the staff at MAG and a lot of them didn't know either before they started. So it is definitely something that you learn on the job. So I thought it would be good to kind of just kind of describe uh, just like our year, sorting from like the beginning of our prep work to the end of the year. Um, our fiscal year starts July 1st and it ends June 30th and then in the middle of that our grants are due. So there's, and our grants are due on March 1st. So there's work that we do pre-March 1st and work that we do post-March 1st. Uh, so first, October to January, we're just making sure we're having the applications ready. Uh, we're going back uh, on our feedback from panelists and uh, applicants to make sure that this year's grant application is a little bit better than last year. So we're always kind of chipping away. Then in November and February, we're traveling the state to help get the word out. Uh, it's really important and it's something that uh, Mississippians value is face-to-face -face time. Um, so that's something that we've also prioritized as well. We also offer online kind of office hours for people who can't make it to all of our events. So this is where a lot of my public speaking comes in because we have to do so much um, to promote the program. Then they have a month to apply. So the applications open in February. They close March 1st. And then after March, we're just reviewing it. We're getting our panelists together. Um, so the panel is a review committee. It's people who are experts uh, in the field or they're familiar with the type of work that people are applying for. And they review them to, based on the criteria to see if they're able and eligible for funding. 
So after that, when we get um, the amount of grants that are, we're able to fund, we um, you know, announce the awards, we issue contracts for those who did not get grants, we offer them panel comments so that they can kind of prepare better for next year. And then throughout the whole fiscal year, we're traveling the state, doing site visits, checking in online, checking in um, you know, via email and phone, and then helping them if they have a change in scope, so that's if their project has to change for some reason, or uh, you know, at the end of the year, they have to report on how they spent the money, and we're helping them uh, with that process as, as well. So a lot of this work, um, I did learn the specifics on the job, and I kind of learned you know, how to do this, um, kind of, you know, be better at it, but a lot of this um, relates to field work and ethnographic documentation and data processing. So you have a lot of those skills already. It requires a lot of criti critical thinking skills, communication skills, and uh, like I said, ethnographic skills. And all of that is like the foundation of, of our training in folklore and a liberal arts education. Um, so this is all stuff that you can do. Uh, it's just kind of learning the specifics. Um, and then this is this next slide. This is kind of the last thing about grants. This is things that I've kind of learned along the way. Um, just kind of, I guess, softer skills, maybe more interpersonal skills. But it's just really important to build trust in your community. You know, not everyone trusts state employees, government workers, you know. Um, so showing up, being a presence, kind of showing them that you are there for them that um, you will help them so that if they are overwhelmed, you know, they don't have to be. We are there to kind of um, hold their hand if we have to. Um, and also just, we have a lot of first time grantees in Mississippi. Uh, I think a third of our grants this year that we just got were first timers. So people don't know any, those people don't know anything about that process. So we try to make it easier for them. And that is a part of building trust. So they kind of know the faces to the name on the website. Um, and then knowing the state and what the needs of your constituents are, each state has its own set of challenges and it's really important to know that. Um, so you can maybe add new grants or change up the way that you do grants within you know, the limitations that you have. Um, and then of course, this is very much related to our folklore training. You have to know the sense of place of the state and the sense of place of those regions. So it's, it's important to know differences in regional culture when you're promoting the grants. Um, like, you know, knowing that people on the western Gulf Coast, they're not going to come to events that happen on the eastern Gulf Coast. So you kind of have to plan around that. Or people in Oxford might not come to something in New Orleans. Um, so just kind of things to know about your state. And then, of course, this job, the programmatic side and the grant side, it is about relationships. It's, you know, people helping people, working with people. So checking in, making multiple site visits, just kind of knowing that you have, like, you have their back, you know, and that they know that. That's really important. And that way they feel comfortable in the process. And then making note of their situation. Sometimes they're telling you what's going on in their organization. And if it isn't anything that you have to document for the grant, just still like make a note of it so you can kind of like give them one-on-one -on -one attention and you know help. And then of course you have to know how to write well and uh, how to communicate well to offer people technical and grant writing assistance. So we help people like during the pandemic, we help people learn how to use Zoom. We help people learn how to log into eGrant. Some people may not be as comfortable on computers or using the internet. So we are on the phone, we're walking it through, you know, walking them through that process. Sometimes they come to the office, or sometimes we make house calls and go to them. Um, so being in, this is a job of service, you know, public service. So having the skills to be able to offer that assistance is really important. And then of course creating other resources and other options of funding, because we can't fund everything. And so letting them know that there are other options out there besides MAC. Um, if they can't get what they need from us. Now, other skills that I learned on the job, and I'm, okay, I'm almost done. I think, oh, okay, we're still pretty good on that. Um, personnel management. Um, this was the first time that I was ever in a leadership role. So I had to learn, you know, 
What is the state contract system? How to write a contract? How to hire someone? What questions do you ask? What do you need to know when you're hiring someone? Um, how to lead a team? And a part of that is like setting expectations, setting clear goals, and kind of managing uh, what you want for them in terms of deliverables. So that's what they turn into you, the kind of finished product. Um, this is something that I'm still growing uh, as, a, as an employee, as a person, kind of being a leader. Um, it's definitely 100% I, I learned it on the job. And I, I really relied on my coworkers to help me out with that. So uh, hopefully, Emily, I'm doing all right. <laughs> um, okay, and then I also, this is something that surprised me about myself was managing a state budget. I had thought it would be kind of boring, but I actually really love accounting. And I could totally see myself uh, being an accountant <laughs> as a backup. But I just, I love numbers. They don't lie. Um, they're very clear. Uh, they're just easy most of the time. Unless, you know, a project totally blows up and you have to figure out how to reallocate the funds. <laughs> but other than that, um, yeah, I, I love that type of work. It's kind of exercising a different muscle. You know, I haven't really used math in years. You know, <laughs> uh, so I enjoy doing that. And then, of course, managing social media. I have some promotional materials there. This is something that I think my folklore training prepared me for because when you're working with graphic designers, web develop developers, social media coordinators, you're kind of communicating in like group speak. And you have to learn how they talk to each other because sometimes, like, there have been a couple of times, you know, working with Tyler on this, where there was just a complete miscommunication because he thought that I meant something else. You know, because for him, he defined it differently. Um, so that, that was just a really interesting experience, working kind of in this kind of tech side and doing this job and kind of learning how they talk to each other and communicate with each other. But of course, as a folklorist, I, I kind of bounced back pretty quickly. And then of course, event planning, logistics, building audiences, kind of just making sure you have everything to make the event a success, and how to build audiences. One thing that I learned in Mississippi, <clears throat> um, you know, folk and traditional arts programming is something that people are interested in, and when they're there, they love it, and they have a great time, and they're like, wow, this is so awesome, I'm so glad that I came. But there is a lot that, um, there's just a lot out there that's um, competing for people's attention. So I have found partnering with organizations that have a built-in audience, you know, and being a part of a larger project has really helped me build an audience. And that's something that I kind of learned on the job through uh, creating partnerships with organizations. And you'll hear that a lot maybe <coughs> if you um, kind of read about public folklore or kind of work on the state level, like at an arts agency, partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. But it's really kind of collaborating on an organizational level. So people that are doing similar work to you at other organizations, you know, maybe both of you had lim limited resources, and you kind of work together to kind of make the project um, a success. Um, and so partnerships is, is something that I learned on the job. Other skills um, that I've honed on the job that I kind of, you know, got an introduction to at IU, but I do think it's really important, like maybe now, to start working on this because I use these a lot. <coughs> um, public speaking, I do that a lot. I always get nervous uh, when I'm speaking in public. Um, but I think just with practice, you maybe you won't, like, I'll, I'll always probably be a little bit nervous, but it becomes easier. And I have to do so much with the public and, and this job that just getting practice doing that, uh, it makes it easier. Photography and audio recording, I think this is really important. Um, if you, I just think it's really important to be a good photographer and to be able to capture uh, really solid, crisp, clear like audio recordings because that's something that's going in the archive. Maybe you can use it for a future project or maybe you have to use it for the project you're working on. And if you don't have the budget to hire a professional photographer or the time, you have to rely on yourself. And also on the job, I'm constantly carrying around my camera. And so if you, you won't always have a professional photographer walking around with you, you know, so you really kind of need to hone those skills. I was very lucky that Matt uh, paid for me my first year. They paid for me to take photography classes to kind of get better at it. Um, 
there's also, uh, if you email me, there's like an online resource that people do, like a year with a digital camera. Um, I bought that to kind of um, get more familiar with my skills that I'd love to, I'd love to kind of take up pretty soon. But um, that's another kind of free, it's $25, so uh, if you email me, I can kind of send you the link to that. But I just think it's really important in the work that we do to be uh, proficient in, on the tech side of documentation. And then just writing for a general audience, uh, it's a lot different than academic writing, so kind of exercising those skills. I got a lot of that training at TAI, and that has helped me um, at Mac. And then, of course, public service. Um, it's not about you. Um, and so it's really important to kind of remember that, that you are just the facilitator. You're not the center of the program or the attention. Um, it's about the artists. It's about your state and uh, the people that you work for. So that is something that I find very rewarding. Um, and yeah, we've made it to the end. Uh, last slide. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is, let me just see where we are. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, so I have about a minute or two left. Uh, this is kind of tips that I've kind of um, talked about in the event before, uh, but I'd love to share them with the rest of you here. <coughs> um, if you can be, actually that was, a, this first one was a tip that John gave me, and it was some of the best piece of advice that I ever got. Um, so John told me, you know, to be a panelist for the Indiana Arts Commission, I reached out to them, and I was lucky enough to be able to be a panelist. So reach out to the Indiana Arts Commission, you can reach out to me, um, other, if you're connected to another state, reach out to them. We are always looking for panelists. And if they have all their panelists, see if you can be a note taker for that panel. At MAC, we hire note takers to, um, to kind of just write, transcribe kind of everything that's said so we can give that back to the grantees. And that's also a good way to uh, gain uh, experience on the other side of grants, not just applying for them, but kind of being a part of that uh, grants structure. Um, and you can look at state agencies. So, like I said, me, you know, at MAG, the Indian Arts Commission, also look at regional arts agencies. I've been a panelist for South Arts because I'm in uh, the southern states. There's also Arts Midwest. Uh, if you're from another part of the country, look at those regional arts agencies too. They often have grant programs where they're looking for um, panelists. Um, and then if you've applied for grants, include that on your resume. Um, so I was telling this to the students uh, before. Um, the one question that I thought I, I just thought, well, maybe I didn't get this job. Because I messed up the question of, they asked me, how, do you, how are you going to manage your grants program? And I was like, <laughs> I don't know, like I don't really know what that means, you know? Um, so I talked about my work, like actually, you know, John, he kind of let us be a part of like the NEA final reports and just kind of let us see that process. So I talked about that um, and then I talked about my work as a panelist. So in preparing for this talk, I asked Larry, the deputy director who hired me, I said, hey Larry, remember when I messed up that question? What were y'all thinking in that moment? And he was like, well, it was because you had some grants experience. Like, you had been a part of grants in some way, so we knew that you could learn it on the job. Um, so, yeah, if, if, a, if a part of your research in, uh, requires applying for grants, please include that. I think that's definitely a bonus. Um, when you're taking your classes, be a generalist. Now, of course, you know, it's important to kind of have your own specific research and kind of what you're doing, but also take time to learn about other different art forms. Because when you work at an agency like that, you're serving the whole state and you're serving every type of artist that lives in that state. So it's kind of important to be a generalist there. Um, it's also important to, um, I think, know uh, the kind of arts infrastructure, you know, nationally. Um, so resources to do that, and because of time, please look up the um, National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. This link here, if we have time, I'll show it, but they kind of give an overview of what everyone does at State Arts Agency, so if you want to learn more about it, they're a good resource. Also, the NEA and the NEH, uh, National Endowment for the Arts, National Endowment for the Humanities, they're big funders of this work. So looking at their websites will give you an idea of the type of work that uh, State Arts Agencies do. Also, get involved with local folklore.
Folklore Societies. I've been involved with the Louisiana Folklore Society since I was a grad student, and it really kind of helped me see um, what's out there. What are, pe what are the people in your state that are interested in folklore? What are they doing? So it kind of gives you a bunch of different perspectives. Um, now I'm on the board of the Louisiana Folklore Society. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of been fun. I really enjoyed that. And then reach out to public folklorists. You can reach out to me. Um, my email address and phone number is on every single sheet of paper up here. Um, so don't be afraid to call us. And I mean, I guess I can only speak for myself. Um, but I'm sure that other public folklorists would be okay with an email or a call. Uh, so you can learn more about their work. And then, so the contracts that I was telling you about, um, look for local state contracts, maybe in the summers or over the breaks in the semester. My coworker Kristen Brandt, who is a trained folklorist at WKU, she did this at MAC, and um, her doing multiple contracts over the years through her graduate school program, that ultimately got her a job, and um, now she works at MAC. She's my colleague. She, she runs the arts industry program. And she gave me permission to share that story. Um, okay, and so uh, this kind of concludes my presentation. These are the websites. That's our website, arts.ms.gov. This is Mississippi Folklife, and this is the directory website. Um, so I guess now I can, I think we're still okay on time. We have about like 20 minutes or so for questions, 25 minutes. Uh, people want to start asking questions. Why don't we do the round of applause first? Oh, okay. I don't have a question. I have a, can I make an announcement? Oh, yeah, sure. My announcement is very related to what Maria just said. Tomorrow from 10 to 12, we have hired a professional photographer to give a two-hour photography workshop. So please come. You just heard from Maria how important it is to be a really good photographer. This was done for you. Please come 10 to 12 tomorrow. Where? At the Global International Studies Building 1100. Look at the bulletin, please. <laughs> Please feel that you should fill the questions here, but we'll also have opportunities to have some questions with uh, beer or soda or something like that. If you have this yeah, and I'll also say um, I took out like 10 slides, so this is this pre this presentation was way longer, but I was like, well, I don't want to bore anyone. So if you have if you want to talk about this after two, I have more info. Uh, yeah, Caroline. Um, so if you were saying include grant like grant application experience on your resume, do you mean like just grants that you've gotten or just like, because like I study in Ireland, I've applied for so many grants yeah, I didn't yeah. get. Um, I think on the resume it would probably be uh, better to do the ones that you've gotten, mm -hmm. but if they ask you about that in the interview round or if it comes up in a cover letter in some way, um, I think it's okay to mention that. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Because, you know, Larry said that, he said that was a plus for me, so. Uh, maybe it can work for y'all as well. Yeah. Um, you said that you were sort of piggybacking on other organizations in terms of organizations that have audiences already. What is an example of that? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so, actually, it's something that I'm doing next weekend. Um, the apprenticeship showcase this year is April 1st, so it's next Saturday. And we only had crash people um, apply. We didn't have any musicians this year. And um, they were all affiliated with the Mississippi Craftsman's Guild in some way. And um, every year in the fall and the spring, the guild uh, does a demo day. So that's where members of the guild can come out and they do demonstrations. Each uh, artist has a demo prepared and then they also have a table with their work. So it's kind of come and go for like five hours. You know, you can come up, talk to the artist, ask them about their work, and then see their work. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, and so uh, I reached out to the guild earlier in, uh, in the year, like at the, towards the beginning of the year, and I was like, hey, would, would it be all right if we did our apprenticeship showcase during the spring demo day? Because for the showcase, usually with craft people, we do do demonstrations, and all of our apprenticeship teams are members of the guild, so we'd be a part of it. 
And so they said yes, and they've been, and it also helps with promotion. So they have their own built-in audience, and they've been promoting it, you know, online and on Facebook and within their newsletter and their networks, and then we've been doing that on our end. So hopefully we can, you know, our combined forces, we can get uh, more people to show up. So that's an example. Another example is like the B.B. King Museum. Mac, we don't have our own exhibit space. We're, we only have state office space. So partnering with local museums where there's a connection to the work and see if we can fit in their calendar throughout the year, that's another way that we partner too. And it helps them too because they can include that as part of like their programming. Yeah. In a related uh, vein, so when you talked about going around to promote the grants and really reach out to the community and that front, where are you going and how are you like deciding where you're going to go? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So this year, um, we went to 14 counties. Mississippi has 64. I think it's 64. Um, so we went to 14. There's only five of us of the 11 people that travel the state uh, that work on the grant program. So that limits us. So we try to hit every kind of sector of the state. So we try to do like northeast, well, yeah, northeast, northwest, the center. Um, we try to go beyond Jackson, uh, kind of the river area, and then on the coast. So every year we try to hit those sectors, but then we also try to hit different towns every year. And we just try to be as fair as possible. Um, we can't make it to every region all the time, but you know, that's kind of our goal. Does that answer your question? Yeah, when okay. you're going to those different counties and places, like where are you, like where are you going? Oh, where? Um, museums, community centers, the library, uh, education centers, just, community spaces. Sometimes they're affiliated with us, they may be a grantee and they offer us their space, or sometimes we'll reach out to other areas so we can get kind of different types of people. Uh, like I went to the Rotary Club uh, one uh, this year, I went to, to, to promote, and there was a guy who worked at the baseball stadium in Jackson who was like, I want to apply for a grant uh, to do arts programming at the baseball field. And I was like, cool, like, I w we would have never known that had I not gone to the Rotary Club. So we try to just um, hit a different, you know, kind of sectors of, uh, you know, Mississippi business communities. And, you know, we try to hit it all if we can. What? Yeah, that's like everything. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. And then, okay. Yeah, yeah, you. Sorry, it's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Stage makes us awkward. Um, yeah. To, just to clarify before I ask my question, so I don't make a fool of myself. You said you, you grew up in the South, right? You don't just have family ties there. Oh yeah, I'm from Louisiana. Okay, so what is it like, especially given that our, our AFS theme for this coming fall is uprooting and rootlessness and all of that, what is it like going back to your region? with this new, this new hat on? How does that shape your relationship to home? How does it shape how you relate to the people that you work with? I know it's a different state, but. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, actually, because my introduction to folklore was in Louisiana, and then I started working with Maida, and working with the Gaines Mardi Gras community, I feel like um, I've also kind of had that folklore hat in Louisiana too. Um, and ultimately I'd love to get back there and be a folklorist in Louisiana. You know, that's where I'm from. You know, that's kind of where this whole journey started for me. It's kind of, um, you know, I'm really passionate about, you know, Louisiana culture. But, you know, related to your question, I mean, all of Louisiana is reckoning with an uprooting right now, you know. Uh, in terms of climate change migration, you know, Hurricane Ida, you know, that devastated my hometown. Um, and people more now more than ever, you know, my brother who never left Louisiana is like, maybe we should move, you know. So I think the whole state is kind of reckoning with that and, um, you know, collectively. Um, but I, one of the reasons why I, I took this job, well, I mean, you know, it's a good job, and you know I didn't have any other offers. But also, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's uh, you know it's kind of part of the dream to kind of work at a you know folk life program, you know. But 
I like that it was so close to home, you know? Like, I went to Mardi Gras this year. Um, yeah, I'm always able to go home for all the fun events and, you know, eat crawfish. And, you know, all the, I'm going to eat crawfish two weeks from now in Louisiana. So I wouldn't be able to do that if I, you know, didn't live so close, only live three hours away. So I don't really feel, like, disconnected from Louisiana, living in Mississippi. And, um, oh, sorry, John, and then I'll, I'll just say this. Gulf Coast, Mississippi is so culturally similar to Louisiana. There's so many Louisiana transplants and the culture is very much the same. So when I'm on the coast, I very much kind of feel at home as well. I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. Okay. We continue. Yeah, 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 sure. Oh, I think we got a question in the back and then John. Yeah. Is it me? Yeah, yeah. Um, also, hi. I, 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 yeah, we met at, uh, we met at AFS, did Yeah, we're NASA. NASA, yeah.
I really like kind of working with the community in a direct way. I just so enjoy getting to know all the artists that I'm working with, all the uh, arts organizations that I'm working with. And I like putting the kind of academic side of my training um, into practice and kind of, you know, putting it out there through exhibits, you know, working uh, with artists, either doing online programming. I just like the nature of the work. I like that, um, I don't know, I guess I'm more extroverted. Uh, I just, it's just really hard for me to kind of just be locked up at in the desk, you know, writing. You know, writing is something that um, is not always fun for me. Uh, academic writing, uh, it is something that, um, eh, you know, I can do it, okay, but it's not like I'm having the best time. Um, so I just kind of, I, I like, I like writing for a general audience as well. I love the collaborative nature about it. That was another thing too. You know, in academia, um, a lot of the work you're doing is kind of solitary. Um, you know, you have, you're reading alone. You can, you can read in the same room as people, and you can write in the same room as people, but the actual work you're doing alone. And being kind of more of a, like an extroverted person, I just really need the social aspect of public folklore. Um, it just kind of fits my personality. Also, you know, I didn't know this, you know, while I was at IU, but I love Grant's work. I didn't think that I would. I thought it would be kind of, you know, something, you know, part of the job that, you know, administrative stuff. But I love um, being a part of that process, making it better, advocating for the grantees, um, getting to know all the great work that's being done in Mississippi. I don't know, I just really, I just really like it. It suits my personality, I guess. It's kind of more of a personal choice. Um, and I, I do like that I think there's more job options out there. Now, in terms of mobility, it is tough, you know, because you have to go where the job is. That's something that's kind of a downside to it. But I guess it's the same in academia as well. You, know, you have to go where the job is. Um, and then also, I think, you know, we were just talking about that before the talk. Like uh, my, um, my predecessor and the deputy director, Larry, in order for him to move up, he had to go, you know, more into administration. So you're kind of going away from the work to move up. That's another thing that I wish kind of were better. Um, but, you know, overall, I, I find this work really fulfilling. Does that answer the question? Yeah. 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 Okay, all right. I just wanted to testify a little bit. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, another, any other questions? Okay. The calm is a good time to let us remember that there is some opportunities for more conversation over at Alice. And I do invite you to take a look at some of the pamphlets. Oh, uh, yeah. There's some interesting yeah. part pamphlet, part poster that you could have. Yeah, find. okay. Uh, uh, let me just show you all this while well, I have your attention. Uh, I worked with Connor Tadlock. Uh, he designed, I said that, he designed the Folklife Directory website. He's my favorite uh, graphic designer in Mississippi, besides Emily, but you were in Um So I really wanted a, a dynamic piece of, um, you know, like a something tactile that I can give people when I was promoting Mississippi folk life. Because we're online, it's hard for people, you know, to be like, oh, MississippiFolklife.org, go check it out, you know? Um, so I wanted to give them something to take with them. Um, and so I, we actually did a, a segment. This is like the first half of this essay. This is my favorite essay that we've ever published at Mississippi Folk Life. Um, and then we made it into a poster. So you can kind of hang it on your wall too after you've kind of gotten the information. It's also an art object. Um, Mississippi is definitely a state that kind of values, you know, in-person kind of promotion, paper promotion. So um, it's kind of knowing your audience. And people love these. Whenever I go out, I usually put them out. And people are like, whoa, can I have one? Uh, you know, uh, so it's, it's eye-catching. It, it gets people's attention. This is a surfing community on the coast. Um, Mississippi surfers get stoked when the tide falls. <laughs> Catch a wave. Uh, I love this article, too. Um, and oh, this article I forgot to have mentioned. Uh, the Soul Man of Clarksdale, not a eulogy. This is about a local uh, blues and gospel DJ who really had an impact on the larger uh, music community in Clarksdale. 
Uh, he passed away, but he has left a strong legacy, so we wrote about him. And then uh, this is uh, just an easy promotion, not where you have to like fold it and, you know, just something I can carry for Mississippi Folk Life and the directory. And it's all about just kind of catching people's attention on the table. Whenever I'm at these events, you know, there's often other vendors, you know, people, um, you know, they have stuff like this. And you want people to look in your direction. So this is, I guess, something I also learned on the job, is um, thinking about things like this. Uh, so yeah, feel free to take some. And uh, this is my card here. You want to take my card? Yeah. Thank you, Governor. All right. If anyone needs a ride, I can take a couple more people. Okay. Don't feel like walking.